Uh, I'm delighted. Again, we've got a, a great panel with us this afternoon. Uh, on my left, your right, we have Kevin Ward, who is uh, editor uh, of the South Wales Argus, Holly Robinson, who is uh, editor of the Western Telegraph, uh, and Jonathan Roberts, who's editor of uh, what is now uh, Wales' biggest selling daily newspaper, uh, the Evening Post in Swansea. So uh, I'm delighted we've got a, a great team. We'll have the same format that we had before. We'll hear from each, interspersed with questions, and then try and pull it together at the end. And please continue to use uh, hashtag news deficit if you want to continue to uh, tweet the discussion. Uh, we'd be delighted if you did that. So um, let's get underway. And Kevin, perhaps I could ask you to start. I just wanted to say a couple of thank yous bef before we start. First of all, thanks for the invitation. Uh, from Rosie and uh, for organising uh, today and as one of her constituents uh, my thoughts are with, with her today. Also thanks to David for stepping in so uh, so ably. Uh, I'm not sure I want to say thanks for having the classic graveyard post-lunch slot uh, or indeed the post-Kevin Maguire slot. Um, but then nevertheless I'll, 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 I'll try and keep you engaged uh, um, I hope. Um, I have to say I wrestled for a few weeks after this invitation as to, uh, over what to say uh, and some of the points I'll make have been informed by, I thought, an excellent discussion the, the, this morning, um, but most represent how I felt for some time about the connection between regional media uh, and politics. And I thought that maybe I should avoid simply giving you a list of reasons why you shouldn't shoot the messenger. But after giving the matter plenty of thought, I'm going to give you a list of reasons as to why you shouldn't shoot the messenger. <laughs> um, but before I do that, I'm going to take the liberty of making a political, in the small p, point uh, of my own on behalf of, of, of my industry. Um, and, and before I say what I'm going to say, uh, I, I absolutely accept that uh, the regional newspaper industry has gone through some really tough times since about 2007, 2008. Some of those problems are of, of our own making, um, some of them aren't. Um, but it's important, I think, to state, and I think Kevin Maguire uh, touched on it uh, before lunch, that the death of the regional newspaper industry has been greatly exaggerated. Um, our, our audience, my audience at the South Wales Argus, uh, is bigger now than it was five years ago. Our print sales are down, but if you look at our combined audience, we have 350,000 people a month, different people, come to our website. We have about 25,000 people following our various Twitter feeds uh, and about 5,000 people liking us on Facebook. I assume that means there's 10,000 who don't like us on Facebook. Um, but our overall audience is bigger than it was five years ago. The difference is what the audience want has changed. And uh, if you go back, I've been in this industry for nearly 30 years, uh, since, uh, uh, since I was a 17-year-old cub reporter. And in those days, very much, you gave the readers what you thought they wanted when you decided they, they wanted it. And that's not where we are now. Now we've got a group of people who want news and sport and information when they want it, where they want it, in a form that they want it. And that's one of the biggest challenges that we, we face going forward as, a, as, a, as an industry. However, I don't know, I think we asked earlier how many uh, AMs or politicians were in the audience. Has that changed? <laughs> Nearly. <laughs> um, <laughs> And what I'm about to say, uh, before I move on, really is a message to um, two politicians, uh, and particularly AMs, because so concerned have AMs been about the state of the Welsh media, and as I said, no one will deny that our industry has been through extraordinarily tough times in recent years, but so concerned have they been that there have been no fewer than three different assembly inquiries into the state of the Welsh media uh, over the last uh, uh, six or seven years. And what's the result of those inquiries been? Uh, what sort of help has been given, in particular to the Welsh print media that our elected representatives are so concerned about? Well, the answer, I'm afraid, is absolutely nothing. Um, there's been some proposals made about broadcasters, but, but almost nothing uh, about the print media. I say almost nothing because actually there has been one proposal to come out of the Assembly in relation to the print media, <coughs> actually at the same time as the last inquiry was taking place. Uh, and that proposal was to end the legal duty of public bodies to advertise their road traffic notices in local newspapers. Uh, thankfully, as an industry, and that included the NUJ, uh, we fought and defeated that proposal. But you very much had a situation there where, on the one hand, uh, our politicians were preaching concern about the future of my industry, and on the other, they were making a proposal that would have put an end to one of our substantial revenue streams. And in reality, could well have put many smaller weekly newspapers out of business. Uh, and David will, will well know that we, we lobbied as an industry uh, very hard on that. I don't think that's gone away. It'll, it'll come back again, I'm sure. 
Anyway, point made. Let's move on. Um, I genuinely believe, and again, uh, Kevin Maguire spoke about this uh, before lunch, but I genuinely believe that in the current post-Leveson climate, uh, it's all too easy to pin the blame for everything and anything uh, on the media. So last year, when we had the lowest ever turnouts at the polls for the police and crime commissioner elections, remember those? I don't blame you if you don't. Um, the very first reaction from Downing Street was to blame the media for poor coverage. So ignore the fact that it was a policy that nobody wanted and even less people understood. Uh, ignore the fact the government was so disinterested in their own policy in those elections that it spent an absolute pittance on promoting them. Blame the media. Uh, and I'm not trying to steal Jonathan's Sunday thunder here, but um, let's look at the measles epidemic in, in Swansea, a bit more up to date. What's happened there? We'll blame the Evening Post for a 20-year-old campaign. You know, let's not waste time on a proper investigation into the low MMR take-up. Let's take the easy route, which is blame the media. And, and we live now, I think, in a very, very black and white world, unfortunately. So <clears throat> if you go back to the M MPs' expenses scandal, the upshot of that was, well, every politician's on the make and every politician is a crook. And the, the upshot of phone hacking uh, and Leveson is every journalist uh, is a crook and is hacking phones. I give talks all the time to WI groups and, uh, and that kind of thing. And, and in years gone by, the one question I always knew I'd get asked is, why does the print come off on your fingers? Um, now, the one question I always get asked is, do you hack people's phones? It's a nonsense. A small group of people are, on a couple of newspapers in London did it. And what they did was criminal, illegal, against the law. The Press Complaints Commission, now in its death throes, absolutely destroyed for not doing something about it. They're not the police. They couldn't do anything about it. They're a regulator. They were there to act on people's complaints. Now, if they made a mistake, it was probably that when they went to News International and said, you hack people's phones, and they said, oh, not us, Gov. No, we don't do that. They just accepted it, and they didn't refer it back to the police, which is what they should have done. But phone hacking was a failure of the law in this country. It was not a failure of press regulation. Um, and, and that black and white world, you know, means that we, we, we are in the situation where my industry is being, uh, I think, apart from a few cases, really unfairly treated at the moment. The democratic deficit in Wales, I believe, is no better or worse than other parts of the UK. I think it's fueled in general uh, by a public that's sceptical and distrustful, not so much of politics, but of politicians and the political system. Uh, and I have to say that much of the blame for that lies fairly and squarely with politicians. I've got a view that people are absolutely bored to tears with punch and judy politics. Uh, they're bored with political parties that to them all look and sound the same with the difference in policies often no more than the width of a piece of tissue paper. But the interesting thing is people are interested in politics. If you ask people, are you interested in politics, they'll say no, and they trot out all the same stuff about, oh, they're all the same and all this kind of stuff. But if you say to them, as we're doing this week in, in Newport, are you interested in the fact that this primary school is, is threatened with closure? They absolutely are. If you ask them questions about uh, art galleries and libraries being under threat of closure, they absolutely are. So people are interested in politics. And do we have a role in the Welsh media in trying to address that democratic deficit, the question we're asked today? Well, of course we do, to an extent. Uh, but we've also got a duty to reflect the views and opinions of our readers. And I don't believe our job is to talk down to them or browbeat them about their lack of interest in or their antipathy towards politics or politicians. So I don't believe you should blame the media uh, for a decline in people's interest in politics. And let me tell you what we do at the South Wales Argus. And I, I, earlier, there was a lot of talk about London-centric. Um, in relation to Wales, and I think if you ask a lot of people outside of Cardiff, uh, uh, they will talk about Cardiff-centric. So for those of you who are Cardiff-centric, the South Wales Argus is the daily newspaper for Newport, which is a city about 10 miles to the east, just outside England. <laughs> and, and home, I hasten to add, to Britain's newest football league uh, club. Um, but at the Argus, in print and online, we cover politics every single day. Uh, we send reporters to community council meetings, city council meetings. We have a reporter at the assembly at least one day a week. All of our MPs and AMs in our circulation area write a column for us on a rota basis. Uh, and we run a weekly political column that looks behind some of the key issues that affect our readers. And all of those are changes that I've brought in in the last year since I became editor at the Argus, because I recognize that politics is important 
even if it could not seem to be interesting. Part of our job is to try and make that interesting. So my brief to my reporters is, if you go to a council meeting and councillor A stands up and has a row with councillor B on party political issues, I'm not very interested, because I don't think our readers are. What they want to know is, what effect do the decisions that their local councillors and AMs and MPs have on their daily lives? And that's, I think, how we should try and get it across to people. Uh, and as I say, I'm not interested in, in, in tit-for-tat politics. Um, in my experience, the only people who tend to be interested in that are politicians themselves. I referred earlier to the, to the police and crime uh, commissioner elections last year. <clears throat> and during those elections, we ran pages and pages of stories uh, about it in the run-up to the election. We gave every candidate uh, uh, in the Gwent uh, election space in the paper to get their policies across. Uh, and we even ran an online hustings debate uh, between the candidates and our online readers. And you know what? One of the polling stations in Newport still had a turnout of zero. So we can ram political information down our readers' throats, but if they're not interested, they won't take it in. And we can get the message out there, but sometimes I think the quality of the message leaves a lot to be desired. And I'd like to see, personally, a lot more of our elected representatives have the guts to stand up and, and talk on their own behalf. So often, as a journalist, uh, when we want to interview a government minister um, or, or even uh, uh, a non-cabinet MP or AM, first of all, we've got to deal with their press officer who will tell us the kind of things that he or she wants to talk about and the kind of issues they want to talk about, and then they'll sit in on that interview, and if Councillor X or AMY says something that's a little bit off message, you might get the press officer leaning forward and saying, well, I'm not sure we want that message getting across. These people are elected. Talk for yourselves. That's what you're elected to do. I, I don't have the answer to the democratic deficit uh, in Wales, but I am sure of one thing, and I I'm absolutely sure of this. The solution is not to have more politicians. I think we need better quality politicians. I think we need people who can engage the public with their ideas and their personalities and people who actually deliver on their manifestos because my belief is that people have had enough of sound bites and spin and broken promises. And I think we need politicians who don't blame the media for their own failure, failings but sit down and work with us. And there's lots of examples of that. I mean, at the moment, we're running a campaign to try and... Uh, help um, uh, promote the use of the uh, minor injuries unit uh, at Ebervale, uh, which is under threat of closure, uh, and we're doing that hand in hand with the local AM. It's a good example of how we can work together. Um, but I don't believe, as Kevin Maguire said this morning, that, that we're the problem. I also don't believe we're the solution. But what we might be is part of the solution to part of the problem. Thank you. Um, you seem to echo some of what was being um, said this morning about, you know, if we need um, uh, better politicians, perhaps not more, less PR control, being more frank and open, and, and this sense that we had from Kevin that maybe what Wales needs is, is a sort of authority figures to lead the debate. Is that, is that something that, you know, you think in, in, in you're looking at your news coverage, do you wish there was, you know, a figure who would lead the debate and shape it a little bit more? Well, I do, and, and, and I'm not suggesting for a second that we haven't got some of that, and... Um, I know I was a bit disparaging about the police and crime commissioner elections earlier, but actually in Gwent, the, the, the guy who won that, uh, an ex-policeman called Ian Johnston, is actually precisely that, that type of figure. Um, you know, kind of says what he, what he feels, is not afraid to shake up the apple cart a bit, not afraid to call a spade a bloody shovel uh, when it needs being, being said. And, I mean, he did an interview with us, for example, a couple of weeks ago where he said that he felt that the police crime statistics were, were effectively being manipulated to, to make things look better for the force. The press officer who sat next to him nearly had a heart attack when he said it. <laughs> but we need more of that. We need more people who are prepared to, to, to stand up and, and, and say what they think, not just to toe the party line. OK, let's open it up to uh, questions. Who'd like to, to kick off for, for Kevin? Go on, don't be shy. Sarah. Take the uh, mic. Oh. You were saying that politics matters to people when it's really local and immediate stuff to do with their hospitals and their schools, and yet around you know the time of the assembly elections, there was a, a polling station that uh, recorded zero. So, what can the assembly <coughs> and uh, 
uh, local papers do um, to, you know, uh, make that kind of relevance much more immediate and obvious to people? Well, I, it was the Police and Crime Commissioner elections, actually, Sorry. that was the, the zero turnout. And, and I suspect that wasn't so much to do with politics, per se, as the fact that a lot of people just didn't understand what they were being asked to vote for. They kind of thought, well, am I voting for a chief constable? But uh, I, I, I'm not going to answer on behalf of the Assembly, because I don't think that's my job. But um, as far as we're concerned, um, you know, my view is that we have a duty to explain politics in, in terms of what it actually means to our, to our readers. And, and I think that's what we try and do. So... Um, you know, when we're referring to, I don't know, the bedroom tax, for, for an example of, of something that's, that, that, that's current, you know, we'll go out and talk to people who are actually involved in that, in that situation. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's the best way of doing it. You know, you, 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 you sort of refer to case studies and, uh, and bring it home to people like that. But I think more and more what, what people also want to feel is that they are being respected um, by the people that, that they vote into office. And, you know, we had a, a, a... I won't name the person involved, but we had a prime example this week in our area where I refer to the fact there's a, there's a school that's under threat of closure and the parents and uh, pupils stayed, staged a big demonstration yesterday and then went into a private meeting with um, some of their ward councillors who also happen to be the cabinet members who are taking the decisions. Um, and, and during that meeting, which I assume got fairly raucous, um, one of the councillors stood up and said, I'm not going to carry on with this if you keep disrespecting me. Well, that's the tail wagging the dog. You know, if, if you're an elected representative, you're a public servant. It's not the other way around. Uh, and, I, and I think, you know, more people in public life need to remember that. Yeah. I mean, I remember this being brought up at another such meeting that we had <coughs> about the, the state of the press in Wales. And um, uh, Martin, I was talking to Martin Shipton of uh, West Mail and NUJ, and he got quite outraged at the idea that there's been a substantial public subsidy to, to the press over the years by way of public notices and indeed in the good old days, huge um, job adverts for the uh, Welsh Assembly Government and so on in the West Mail and so on. Um, and in a sense, those papers which have been owned by multinationals have creamed off the profits, given it to the shareholders, that, that you could argue that money that public money was not reinvested in journalism in Wales. Are you prepared, and I'd be interested in what the others think when the time comes, are you prepared to see some sort of quid pro quo for that, 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 there, that um, there should be some kind of a deal involved in that? Yes, there's public advertising. That is, in a sense, a public subsidy, and we're buying something with it, which could, I know you're not making the profits now, in a way. It's a bit of an academic question, but should there not be a bit of that attitude there that this is an investment, in a sense, in a kind of public service journalism? <laughs> I guess that depends whether I'm going to answer that with my company hat on or, or, as, or as an individual. Um, You're just amongst close <laughs> circle of friends. That's here. right, yeah, yeah no frank. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it is quite a difficult question to answer because it, it kind of, you know, is it a public subsidy? I don't know. You can argue that both ways. You could say that the BBC talking this week about... Uh, going far deeper into, into investing into local um, is also a public, publicly subsidised organisation that is going to be competing more with my organisation, which isn't. You could argue that um, the hyper-local Cathilly Observer website, which is now going to produce a print edition, uh, which is being paid for initially via a, via a public grant of, of European money, is publicly subsidised but is a competitive launch against a newspaper that's already in that area. So that it's quite a complicated area, I think. Um, look, if I speak as an editor of a newspaper, do I want more money to be invested in my newspaper? Of course I do. But, you know, we've also got to live with the harsh commercial realities of life, and that is that, you know, we, we don't just... By the way, it's not every newspaper in Wales is owned by a multinational. Uh, you know, that point needs to be made, because some are still family-owned. But, you know, business is business. And, you know, if you are a... Uh, a company that in the past has made X amount of profit margin, you know, the way that business works is that it, you know, it's, it's built upon debt. That debt has to be serviced. You know, that debt is serviced by <coughs> investors and, and, and those investors will only continue to invest if they believe they're getting a return from it. So, you know, it's, it's not as easy as it, and not as simplistic as it sounds, I don't think. Okay, and you, you made the point, um kind of powerfully that the, the Argus still sends reporters to you know, the council meetings, sends them regularly to the courts and so on as well. Other newspapers, not necessarily in, in, in Wales, but possibly Wales as well, 
uh, have taken a different view that as they have to cut costs, those are the areas they cut back because they don't believe the public are as interested in that as they are in the sport or the celebrity or whatever. Your, your decision to maintain that service, is that based on what you think the public wants or what they need or what your responsibility as a journalist is? Uh, it's based on 30 years in, in the industry and, and you, know, I'm a, uh, you know, we had cut back on some of that stuff uh, uh, b before I arrived in the editor's chair and, I'm, and I'm not, that's not being disparaging <laughs> of, of my predecessor because everybody's got a different view but you know, the, the, the facts are there and the, and the reality is that in editorial terms uh, and in terms of our sales, um, you know, and, and newspaper editors often get uh, accused, you know, of you're only interested in selling newspapers. Well, that's funny, isn't it? Because <laughs> that's my job. Um, but you know, the, the the reality is that the things that um, work best for our readers and the things that that sell us the most papers, in general, are courts and 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 crime uh, and councils um, and that kind of thing. And I still believe they're meat and drink. Um, for local newspapers and you know Kevin Maguire said it earlier you know cherish what you've got because if we weren't here who would be scrutinizing local councils nobody if we weren't here who would be uh, you know covering magistrates courts and seeing that that justice is seen to be done uh, nobody and and you know I think that even though resources are tight there's no doubt about that it's still vitally important that we cover those areas uh, because I think they're hugely important to the public uh, and what happens to the public if those things don't get covered? What's the, what's the risk of the democratic deficit? Well, I just think it widens. Because, you know, if, if, if you're not aware of uh, how justice is, is being seen to be done, if you're not aware of, I don't know, the, 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 um, the senior officers' pay scandal at, at Caffili Council, you know, that, that came out through, through, our, through our coverage after a whistleblower came to us. Um, Peter from, from uh, the BBC uh, earlier today was talking about how, you, how the BBC were covering um, uh, one of the select committees here um, that was looking at the um, Caldecott and Wentloog drainage board uh, and, and, and uh, a scandal with public money there. Uh, and that was a story that we broke you know, nine months ago. Uh, and again, I, I just believe that if local newspapers aren't there or if their coverage is reduced uh, to really sort of tiny levels and we don't do that kind of thing, those things will go unnoticed for years and years. Okay, more questions? Okay. Yeah, lady at the back. Plum I'm Non Gwilym. I work in the National Assembly for Wales. I'm really interested in what you had to say about covering councils. So there was an interesting point this morning for me where I think all the panel agreed that looking at issues was more attractive to their audience than looking at the structures and, it, and monitoring, if you want, the structures that were discussing those issues. That's certainly something we've tried to do here. Our members tell us always that the local papers are interested in how issues they're dealing with on a national level affect um, their constituents in their local areas. So we've tried to develop case studies. We've had a fan fantastic couple of examples in a residential care inquiry where we actually, rather than to say, this is a report from the committee, we worked with some of the stakeholders who contributed and made sure that their stories were known to their local press. We did something similar with a stillbirth inquiry as well. So I'm, I'm interested in what, you th what your take would be on that. So I think we have a role to play here at the Assembly. We have a limited resource here as well. We're a public sector organisation, um, and we have to demonstrate good value for money um, in terms of what we produce. We're trying, we're going down this kind of localised, um, specialised um, route, but it's difficult for us. Um, so it's more of a commentary more than anything else, but I'm really interested in this, in your take on the, let's monitor the structure, the council, or the assembly, versus let's look at the issue and look out to see who's considering it now. Well, uh, to an extent we have to do both, because you know, I think when we're talking about um, you know, uh, political structures, if you like, you know, post-elections and uh, changes to cabinets and leaders and all that kind of thing, you know, obviously we, we cover it. When you're talking about uh, implementation of policy, then you know, my view is the best way of explaining that is, is by showing the people that, that it affects in that sort of case study way. Um, uh, you know, I don't expect um, public organisations or charities or anybody like that to kind of do our job for us, but it helps us a lot um, if you know, a prime example, foster care fortnight, and, you know, I was a foster carer for, for, for a number of years, and the reason I got into it um, was because I, I had real-life stories of, 
of, of, of what it meant to people and, 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 and what it meant to the, the, um, the kids who were cared for. And, you know, that's really important, I think, those kind of case studies. Um, but often it's, it's more about, you know, an organisation pointing us in the right direction towards people who are willing to talk to us than actually, you know, saying let's put a load of resource in actually going to get these case studies and doing the interviews and then just presenting it. So, so case studies and examples is, is one thing. Is there anything else that, you know, a kind of assembly uh, press team can do to support what you need as a local editor? If I'm honest, a lot of a lot of the press offices uh, across our public organisations do a pretty good job on fairly limited uh, resources. I, I go back to the point I made earlier, which is that I would much rather that they actually did less work, and and the people that you know we elect into power um, talk on their own behalf, because um, I think that's far more important. Okay. Uh, any uh, any final questions for Kevin? Yeah. perhaps extends the, 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 the questions that have already been asked, uh, and particularly uh, Richard's point to you then. But uh, Jonathan might have something to say uh, as well on this one. When we all started in 99, there were uh, assembly correspondents at the Argus and the uh, Evening Post, and they were excellent correspondents, incidentally. They produced some of the most interesting stories and analysis that, you know, in, that was uh, in the first assembly. Now, those days seem to have gone and you know, I understand the business model has shifted, but how could y y y the assembly help in getting that sort of level of analysis and, and output? Because clearly, as regional papers, an awful lot of what happens in the assembly is highly relevant. In fact, you are, in many ways, the key papers for us, uh, as you know, Kevin said this morning, with a large <coughs> circulation. So I, 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 how you, it seems to me you're getting quite a lot of uh, coverage from other news sources, but on the, the more political side, assembly side, is there, is there something that we could be looking at now? Uh, I, well, I mean, I accept that there's a certain irony that <coughs> in 99, when the assembly started with far fewer powers than it has now, um, we all uh, decided to invest in, in having reporters sat here five days a week in, in, in an office. And, and the economics have changed, there's no doubt about that. I mean, can I afford to have a reporter uh, in, in the assembly building five days a week, no, I can't. Uh, can I afford to cover it more than we did uh, before last year? Well, yes, I can, and that's why we've got a reporter here based uh, here every Tuesday uh, and, and in touch with all of our local AMs. Um, you know, thing, certain things have changed, th certain things uh, haven't. Um, so, you know, we used to have to uh, uh, pay a fee for office and desk space uh, uh, in the assembly, and there was when I suggested having a reporter back here for a while, there was some suggestion that would still be the case. And I said, well, you either want us here or you don't. Um, I, I mean, I, I think that we are doing a better job now than we did uh, in terms of uh, um, covering the assembly. Um, can the assembly do, do, do more? Well, I think that there's certainly some room for manoeuvre in talking to all of us, as, uh, particularly daily newspapers, uh, in terms of... Um, the feed that goes to um, the BBC for Democracy Live or whatever, well, I don't see any reason why that feed shouldn't be extended to all local newspapers because we've all got websites and we all ca cover carry video. You know, that would certainly help, I think, uh, in terms of getting that across to a, uh, a wider audience. But I think it's down to individual editors. You know, my belief is, yes, the assembly is important and therefore we should cover it more than we did, which we do. Uh, but other editors will have a different view. Okay, well, on, on that note, let's start turning across to other editors. Right, hello, thank you very much for having me um, today. I'm here um, representing the weekly newspapers um, in Wales. Um, I work for the Western Telegraph, one of two largest paid for weekly newspapers in the country. Um, some just general figures from the Newspaper Society. Um, these um, relate to the whole of the UK. I couldn't actually get the Welsh figures um, in time for this, but um, 30.9 million people read a local newspaper every week in the UK. Um, it's the most widely read print medium in Britain. There's 1,100 local newspapers and 1,600 associated newspapers in the UK, according to the Newspaper Society. Um, and in Wales, five daily newspapers, about 29 paid for weeklies, four free weeklies and one Sunday paper. And obviously the, there's other magazines and area um, magazines and Welsh language publications as well. Um, local papers are just that. 
Um, we contain items that matter to our readers, relate to the areas, um, that, you know, the geographic location um, that we work in. But of course, we do cover subjects that matter to our readers um, on, the, on the wider scale as well. So all sorts of decisions that are made here do affect our readers, and we will reflect that. But we may present it, um, as Kevin's referred to earlier, in a way that relates directly to their lives. Um, I moved to Wales three years ago. Um, I didn't know about you know much about how, how democracy, how um, the government worked here at all. Um, and it was an interesting question for me when I moved here. Where do people get their their Welsh government news from? Um, there's some, you know there are some excellent TV programmes. There's some excellent radio programmes, um, and of course there's the Western Mail. But a lot of people d don't go there. Um, and, you know, lo there's lots of information online, but unless you know where to go online or somebody's directing you there, you're not going to necessarily go and click onto it. Um, you know, I'm lucky I get to see all the press releases, I get to meet the politicians, I get to talk about things, and most people don't. Um, but um, as, as a local paper, we are in regular contact with all of our AMs that cover the area. We also encourage people to participate in democracy um, and play their part in local government. And... Um, like Kevin, we cover council meetings, county council, um, we'll cover community councils if something's going on and you know, I can get somebody to a meeting that's relevant. We cover the national park meetings, we go to the health board meetings um, and the community health council meetings. Um, they're a very important part of what we do as a local newspaper and we also still try and attend magistrates court when we can. Um, but with the best will in the world, you know, I have a team of four or five reporters covering the whole of Pembrokeshire doing the whole scope of, of, of news and, um, that, that, that's going on there, we can't do everything. Um, and of course, when it comes to covering um, the Welsh Assembly, we can't send somebody here. We just, you know, it's just not possible. Um, but if there's something going on that is directly relevant to people in Pembrokeshire, we of course will be covering it, whether that's through interviewing the AMs afterwards, watching live streaming, um, you know, th there are ways of getting information um, th that we will do that. Um, and until recently, you know, perhaps it ha our main coverage of issues not directly Pembrokeshire centric has been, you know, we have been running things on things like organ, organ donation, um, plastic bags, referendums. Um, but to say it depends on resources, it depends what else is going on in the week. Um, you know, wh where we are in Pembrokeshire, if something major is kicking off, we'll have less space available for covering more general items. Um, we do, you know, in Pembrokeshire, like most areas, a lot of the major Welsh things that are going on are very relevant. Um, Pembrokeshire has had the issues of the, the potential badger cull, um, TB vaccinations, um, farming, hugely important to, um, to industry in Pembrokeshire, health, obviously, re reorganisation. We've got lots of campaigns going on at the moment, issues with Scaboo and losing that. We've had significant education issues with child safeguarding, a major issue um, in Pembrokeshire. Planning, broadband, transport, roads, all vitally key things to Pembrokeshire that we are covering week in, wing out, week out in our newspaper. So, um, you know, there is this perception that local newspapers don't necessarily cover Welsh affairs, but some of that is just expectation of what, what we as a local paper will have within our pages. There's nothing I'd like to do more than include, you know, have more comprehensive coverage of what's going on here. Um, I used to love covering council meetings, I, it's, it's my kind of thing, but um, we just can't do that. We're reliant on advertising heavily. Um, the, the amount of space I have in my newspaper depends on the advertising. Advertising revenues are, are, are down. Um, it's tough out there for everybody. All, you know, lots of competition for the same pots of money, particularly in a community like Pembrokeshire, um, which means I can't have the extra pages I might want, I can't have the extra stuff I might want, to, and I would need to do any more than we're already doing. Um, but, you know, there's still things that we can do, and um, recently an opportunity came for me to have some more space in the newspaper, and we have started a new um, page specifically dedicated to Welsh matters and what's going on. And part of that is because, um, you know, there is this feeling that people don't necessarily understand how things work and, and what's going on. Um, and, and that's partly just from, talk, you know, my own understanding and my staff's understanding of... of how things work and what the issues are and, and knowing where people do get their information from. So um, we took the decision to include an extra page. We're still working at a, a dedicated page on, on matters that are happening here. 
which um, we've been including lots of stories that would, would not otherwise get any space in the newspaper. That's very early days. It's been going about six weeks, I think, now. We're waiting to see what kind of feedback we get and also how we can develop that um, and perhaps involve the AMs a bit more in, uh, in what we do with that. But there's a lot of talk about um, declining newspaper sales generally, but as, as Kevin was saying, our audience online is continually growing. Um, you know, people will dip in and out of the website through the day um, and come back week, week on week. Um, at the Western Telegraph, we're getting about 400,000 page views a month, um, which is it's fairly significant, 45 to 50,000 unique users a month. Pembrokeshire is a, a population of about 117,000. Um, so, you know, we, we're nearly sort of half the number um, of people there visiting the website every month. That figure, figure always rises. We do get, however, get particular spikes and when something happens. Now, it's very noticeable that the two most read stories on our website this year so far have been the beast of Tembe when a carcass washed up on Tembe Beach. Um, we spiked that month to 70,500 unique users, um, largely because of that one story. We also had 1,500 hits from a Russian website that people coming through. So, you know, it, that's, what, that's the kind of thing that, that's bringing more people to our site. The other um, story that um, was very well read and also appeared in the national newspapers was, um, I don't know if you read about the, the keepy uppy man from Milford Haven, a, a portly sort of 50-year-old um, gentleman who, um, amazing ball skills, and somebody managed to video him and put him on YouTube. Um, and he then got invited to the World Freestyling Championships and things. Um, and they're the two most read stories so far this year on, on our website. Um, but obviously, with the website, space isn't an issue. We can include more. And the important thing is, once you've got somebody on your website, you can then get them looking at other bits and other pieces of information. Social media is obviously a key thing that, that all newspapers are looking at, how we can interact between our, you know, with our readers um, and bring that into what we're doing. Um, so, you know, we all have, um, all the websites will now have their own Twitter accounts. Um, Facebook's very important as well. People seem very willing to comment on stories on Facebook, more so even than on, on our website. So we're using that. And we're also feeding comments and things from those, those platforms back into the newspapers to, to help with the debate. Um, we can also carry things like live blogs. And one that was um, fairly popular recently is, is our sort of election night coverage. Um, and on local papers, it's really interesting to see that people will come in and log in and want to know what's happening minute by minute through, through the evening. Um, we even did one. We had an electoral division by-election recently. Um, and that was for Burton, one of the, our smaller sort of areas in the county. And OK, it only had, you know, it had 440 views, but for the size of Burton, you're thinking, actually, that's quite interesting that, that there was that demand. We were there blogging you know, into late into the evening. Um, and websites are brilliant for traditional news organisations like ourselves. Um, we know people will come to our sites because we're a trusted source of information. Um, we can include picture galleries and the pictures and things that we can't have space for in the newspaper we can put online. We can add things like videos. Um, you know, we have live traffic updates and things on there. So it, it's very good. And um, you know, it's somewhere that our journalists can come into their own because um, amid gossip flying around when an incident happens in town, people can know they can come to our website because we'll have the official trusted information um, of what's been happening. Um, albeit perhaps slower because we do like to check our facts rather than um, just tweet immediately when we find out a piece of information. But um, as other organisations found, having a website doesn't solve everything because you need to direct people there to get, um, to get that information. So um, I still believe that there is a place for, for print media um, and there always, you know, there's going to be for some time to come. Um, and we, you know, we do have a, a very key role to play in helping businesses and organisations promote themselves. Um, many businesses now moving to online websites and, and reducing their advertising spend, but they still need an advert to point people to the websites and where they're going. But um, you know, it's more important than ever to use a mix of approaches um, to get information and news stories out to people. Just look at the police and commissioner, you know, police commissioner elections. One of the biggest complaints from readers in our area was that the only place they could go for information, apart from the articles we were reporting, was online. Um, we did carry a series of articles. Um, we had views for, from the candidates, the two candidates that we had um, in David Powers. And um, 
Pembrokeshire had something like the second highest turnout in the whole of Wales. So while it, it still wasn't a, a terribly high figure, though, but it just so it doesn't matter how many articles and things, that, as Kevin said, that we write. If people don't want to engage, they're not going to. One of the biggest complaints we get from people, you know, you ask them, what, why don't you go and vote? Why don't, aren't you involved? Is that they, they feel they don't trust politicians, that there's not enough difference between everybody anymore. They're a bit disillusioned by the authorities and also by things, you know, consultation processes that become just tick box exercises. We had an incident, uh, a situation recently where um, with all the health changes going on, members of the public were asked to um, participate in a consultation process. Obviously, as a local newspaper, we're encouraging people to to do that and su submit the forms and, and do things. But then the feedback that came back afterwards um, was that there'd been too many responses from Pembrokeshire which had skewed the data um, of the result in the consultation, which you're just telling people, well, it doesn't matter what you say, you know, you, what, what you've said in Pembrokeshire doesn't count because not enough people in Carmarthenshire or somewhere else have, have put the information forward. Didn't leave a very good impression with, with our readers um, who were feeling very ignored. So, um, General participation in democratic affairs is something that I feel needs tackling in all communities. I was very shocked when I moved to Pembrokeshire um, that on the county council, there's 13 out of 60 uncontested seats at the county council level. It just seems amazingly high. Everywhere I've been, there's always uncontested seats, but it seems a lot. Um, so I think we need to look at why don't people stand um, and as well as why don't people vote. Um, in Pembrokeshire, um, you know, you, you still get the comments, oh, my vote doesn't count, it doesn't matter. In Pembrokeshire, it does, because the seats have changed hands, both at um, the Assembly and um, Westminster seats have changed hands quite a few times. The, um, particularly in South Pembrokeshire, West Carmarthenshire um, area, um, it's been too close to call in both elections when everybody you talk to, it could have been one of three parties that, that would win that seat. So people's vote does count in Pembrokeshire, um, and, you know, and therefore it's important for people to use that vote I think part of the problem um, is, and again, this, I get this from talking to young journalists and people when they, when they come into the paper, um, any young journalist that comes into a newspaper, we have to train on public affairs. They learn about local government, they learn about how government works um, in the UK, but they don't get that from anywhere else. They come in not knowing much, um, which seems a great shame that, that obviously we're going through the whole education system. I'm exactly the same when I was at school. I wasn't taught about how um, po about politics, how government works. Um, and it seems that that's something key we should be doing with our young people is encouraging them to get involved and realise how important it is to be what, what Pembrokeshire County Council is now calling, you know, be an active citizen in the community. Um, and there's a lot of good work I know that's going on in Pembrokeshire at the moment in our local schools to try and encourage young people in the hope that, that, that they'll carry that through um, their education with them and into adulthood. Um, to encourage them to be, um, you know, active and, and to vote and take a part in and understanding what's going on in their community and being involved with that. Um, some of this has um, come through that they've just recently published a book, a councillor Griff booklet, um, which introduces year five and six pupils to the workings of the council. Um, it's been done in sort of a lively um, way to try and encourage them to learn. Um, and there's a really interesting project they do with the six formers as well in Pembrokeshire, which is where they actually take them somewhere for a day and let them run a council themselves um, and learn about, you know, you need a director of transport, you need whatever it might be, director of social services. Um, and it really engages them and shows them what, what's happening. Um, and, you know, all the schools now as well, they do things like um, mock elections, they have school councils and things. So hopefully that that will be something that, that is developed and, and, you know, this is going to take a, a long time for, th for things to change and to, to come through, but this is one of the things that Pembrokeshire has really identified as something that, that can help. Um, another thing that, that's, um, and it, it's a little bit reflects some of the comments that Kevin made, whereby um, people aren't sort of necessarily willing to stand up and say what they actually really believe. Um, and it doesn't, it's not just politicians, we also get it with people who you know, comments to the newspaper and things where people, A, don't want to give a name anymore, or they don't want to get involved, they don't want to put their head above the parapet in case they're going to get lots of sniping and a backlash on Twitter or whatever it might be. And that's a shame, really, and um, that's something, I think, as well, that we need to be thinking about. Um, I'm not sure there's a how, how you solve that problem, but I think that's an issue that we need to be encouraging people um, that, yes, you, you do have a right to say something, 
Um, and of course, everybody has a right to write to their, their local newspaper and, and talk about issues, and we, we will highlight things and take up a cause where appropriate. So what I'd say is that while the Welsh local and regional media may be, um, you know, there are areas where it's lacking, we do have some excellent newspapers that should be supported um, in any way they can be. Um, you know, there's lots of talk now with citizen journalism. You see the events in Woolwich. It's all come through Twitter and, and um, you know, people there on the scene with their mobile phones. But there's still a place for professional journalism where facts are checked um, and news is presented in an independent way. Um, and all sides of, a, of a, a matter are given an opportunity to be heard. And it's not all doom, doom and gloom, as I say. You know, there's lots of really good things going on, and we're do, you know, trying to do our bit at the Western Telegraph. I mentioned we do now have a page dedicated to Welsh news. We've also recently introduced, um, and it's gone a bit, you know, in the old days we all used to have our council page and that kind of thing. We've reintroduced that kind of page, but more from the forum of including um, interesting debates and comments from councillors who, on subjects that, that may not have actually come up at meetings, but it's something that they're interested in. We include a list of where all the meetings are being held that members of the public can attend. Um, we run that weekly. Um, and no doubt, when it comes to election time, we'll be encouraging people and giving out information on how to stand, how, you know, how to vote, make sure how you're registered to vote. Um, lots of these things we do anyway, but to get, it, it's a way of making sure that we do it every week in the newspaper. So, um, you know, there is um, lots of things, and that there is a, a democratic deficit, I would say, but I think it goes beyond this perceived lack of coverage by the media. Um, and I think we need to encourage people from all angles to, to do their bit and be active in the communities. Um, and we need to encourage people to use all the outlets to get their voices heard, and that includes local newspapers. I want to just pick up on, on one thing you said. Uh, uh, I think I got this right. You said you, you can't afford to send a reporter to every council meeting anymore. That's certainly not in the scope of what you're able to offer. Um, we, we try to get to as many of the major council meetings as we can do. There will be the, the odd smaller committees that if we've had a look at the agenda, we won't do. But we will, of course, if we don't get to a council meeting, we will follow that up afterwards. So I was going to say, to the extent that you're unable to cover them, um, does, does that matter either to your newspaper or to the community? And, and, and if so, why and how? I think some people perhaps might not notice if, if we didn't cover something, but uh, I think as a local paper, we, you know, we do have a duty to let people know what decisions have been made on their behalves um, by the people that, that they've elected or not, in the case of the uncontested seats, but um, you know, but a duty to let people know what's going it's on. A sen it's a sense of your kind of responsibility uh, yeah. rather than you think the, the, the readers might stop buying it. I, I, think that I think there's a mix of it. I, I don't think it would necessarily make that much of a difference to sometimes readers, you know, some of our readers. However, uh, you know, our job as a newspaper is to include as, as much of everything as we can. Um, and we have a mix of lighter hearted, in, you know, other kinds of stories, human interest stories as well. Okay, great. Who'd like to ask uh, Holly some questions? Holly, I'm, I'm really interested uh, to how you covered the TV question because uh, that really was an important local story, f obviously, if you were in North Pembrokeshire with the, uh, the, the proposed test site. But it was one of the biggest stories, not just for Wales, with the UK at the time, in terms of the approach to this you know, I I issue. Uh, and uh, I know as an assembly member, it doesn't represent, you know, it's, it's 100 miles at least until you get to part of uh, Pembrokeshire from where I... I represent, but you know, I was having emails from all sorts of pressure groups constantly about it. So I suppose my question is, how did you cover the story, and what contact, if any, did you make with the Assembly and with the Wales Government to get information to inform that story, and was that adequate, could it have been done better, or did you rely on other systems entirely? I think um, it was a mix of everything, really. We did have a lot of um, dealings with the press officers here in Cardiff um, and um, all around. But, um, it, I mean, TB has been an issue that's been ongoing in Pembrokeshire for many, many, many years. This, it wasn't a new thing for us. Um, we, I think, that to me, one of the bigger issues that we had and difficulty in getting information was that a lot of the farmers um, and people weren't willing to put... Their, their name out there because they were worried about the backlash that they were going to get if they, you know, if they stood out front and said what they really thought. Um, so at times we were feeling like we were perhaps being a little bit one-sided in some ways because it was difficult to get that other viewpoint out there. Although obviously the unions were very good in in, in helping with, with that. Um, it 
it was a big issue, but it was one that it, in, even in Pembrokeshire, it, it, there was a huge divide between those that were pro-cull and those that, that, that weren't. Um, and, you know, as a local paper, all we could do was reflect all sides. Um, we do also produce two farming newspapers, so obviously they t had a slightly different approach to, to the, the main newspaper. Um, but it, yeah, it was an issue, um, you know, as we tackled it like we would any other issue, you get the views from all sides that you can, as much information as you can, and you put it out there, and you give people a, a, a chance on your letters page to, to you know, debate any further issues and bits that they want to. Just, uh, you mentioned letters pages there. I mean, that's an interesting point. Have you, do people still write letters? Are they email? Do, they, do, do you get that level of engagement, or has that changed over time, do you think? Um, I think it's slightly changed uh, in that um, when you do get letters, they tend to be more on specific issues. So wind turbines is something we get a particular lot of letters about at the moment. The badger cull, as I say, was, was another one. Um, I think people are a lot more willing now on that, that they write on something that they really care about um, and put pen to paper. Um, anything else, they're more, more likely to comment perhaps on the website or in a shorter form online. Um, and obviously a lot of our older readers are still the ones who, are the, who will write the traditional letters. I think younger people no longer um, use that as a way of communication. So, so it's still a forum for kind of your, your readers we, we, to debate we still things, cover but, but we, less than it was. Yeah, we still, I mean, we still, we actually increased um, a number of the amount of space that we were giving over to letters, um, I think last year sometime, um, because we felt that, um, you know, that it is still a form. We, we include at least two pages of letters and comment every week. So it's normally about one and a half pages of letters and then half a page of, that's taken from comments from our websites, whether that's the main website or, as I say, increasingly mm. Facebook comments. Mm. Okay, any, any final questions for Holly? No. No? Okay, Holly, thank you very much indeed. Uh, and we'll put on then to, uh, to Jonathan Roberts from <coughs> South Wales Evening Post. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, seems I've drawn, drawn the short straw here and going third. Uh, a lot of what I'll. You're I'll the finale, say, Jonathan. The finale, you're the, you're absolutely. The main act. Yeah, yeah, been building, everyone's been I'll, your warm up. I'll, I'll take yeah. that, yeah. <laughs> uh, a lot of what I'm, I'm going to say you've, you've probably already heard, but I think it, at least it reinforces the point that we probably all can't be wrong here. We're all experiencing the same kind of issues. Uh, I'll kick off, as, as Kevin did, by just saying uh, a thank you to, to Rosemary for the, for the invitation to speak. Uh, she and I met quite recently where we, uh, we discussed many of the issues we're, we're touching on today. Principally, of course, how, how do we raise the profile of the decision-making process in this country? If we, if we take audience first uh, and ask ourselves a question, when, when a politician speaks, who's really listening? Because while politics is integral to everything that we do, it would appear that it fails to seize the public's attention in, in the same way that the need to register your preference for a dancing dog over an opera singer on a TV talent show might. Voter turnout at elections of recent times that have called the Welsh public to the ballot box suggests apathy and, and disinterest. A little more than 41% bothered at the Assembly election in 2011, uh, and as both Holly and Kevin have touched on, the less said about the the Police and Crime Commissioner's uh, election, the better. So this su suggests a disconnect between our politicians uh, and the public themselves. Now, we in the Welsh press have something in common with our elected members of the Senate. Uh, recent headlines have done nothing to dissuade people <coughs> that the stereotypical image of the politician who's only in it for him or herself, or the reporter who will do anything, literally anything for a story, is very far from reality. So there are perhaps people who, who either don't believe or, or simply aren't interested in what our politicians have to say. An interest in the democratic process is, in my view, a specialist subject. It's not really for the masses. It's never going to attract the same audience numbers as the TV talent shows, even with a dancing dog. And as editors, we're measured, we're measured by many things, but principally it's our ability to sell newspapers. So it's critical for us that our content delivers what it is our audience expects. Now, I have to ask myself, what do the readers of the South Wales Evening Post want to see each day in their local paper? Uh, we have Welsh national and Welsh media organisations that present a balanced digest of the goings-on within the transparent walls of the Welsh Assembly. These, these stories are fundamental to our way of life. They're about our, our health service, our environment, our education, and therefore our children. They're stories, sorry, these are stories of national importance, which is why the media outlets with a national remit can easily make the case for heavy political content for the Senate. 
The question is more difficult when viewed from the regional media perspective. We don't have a national remit, ours is a local one. Uh, and the stories we publish have to be relevant to the people around us. They don't pick up the Evening Post every day to read about Wales. They want to read about Swansea, uh, which is why local government enjoys such a high profile within the local press. It's the same word, it's local, it's relevant. Yes, it could quite easily be argued that a policy affecting Wales therefore affects Swansea. And stories of this nature are already printed in the Evening Post each day, uh, though perhaps not always offered the kind of profile they can expect in the, in the Welsh national media. Which brings me to resource. The regional newspaper industry is undergoing not so much a transformation at present, but, but really it's a revolution. Uh, newspaper sales have been in decline for many years, uh, and yet our audience has never been more engaged. Uh, our websites continue to grow, expand, and gain in popularity. Fewer people today want to read newspapers, but the demand for quality local news journalism has never diminished. People simply want to receive it in alternative ways and at different times. Now, I recently made the point that we're no longer a newspaper with a website. We, we've now become digital media businesses with newspapers. Uh, we live our lives very differently today. We have, we have such a thirst for, for information, for mm. entertainment, and we want it right now. And it would be impossible for a regional newspaper business to survive simply by maintaining the old status quo. The role of the traditional paper is changing. It's no longer the vehicle for breaking news, even within the communities we serve. Uh, and there's a thirst for a different kind of story out there now too. Online it's about the quirky, the user-generated videos, the fun and the entertainment. A colleague of mine tells a, a terrific tale about his time as a reporter for BBC Online. He spent several days researching and writing a political piece for the website. He finished half a day early, so his editor told him to visit a house in West Wales where there was a cat with 26 toes. You can see where this, was, where this is going to end up. The political piece attracted 48,000 visitors and the cat managed 1.5 million. <laughs> now, this change, of course, isn't without its casualties. As, as an industry, we're in a position where one arm of the business, the digital brand, is enjoying significant growth, while the other, the print product, is in decline. Now, some would predict terminal decline, but I think the likelihood of that scenario materializing in the medium to long term, if at all, is, is very much up for debate. We still sell tens of thousands of our newspaper every day, and of course, as, uh, as Kevin mentioned, or it may well have been uh, Richard. The Evening Post remains the country's biggest selling title. That wasn't me, I didn't say that. I, <laughs> as, as I said to you, I thought it probably wasn't, actually. Uh, what is certain, however, is that, uh, is that revenue generation remains the domain of the print product. And combined with the, the perfect storm, if you like, of the worst economic environment in history, you're left with, in the case of some newspapers, falling revenues, meaning fewer resources and then tighter management of the remainder. There are fewer jobs for journalists today. That's an unfortunate reality of the modern world of newspapers. In an ideal world, an editor could send a dozen reporters to the Senate each week, but with a smaller resource, reporters have to be directed to where they're guaranteed to be most productive, uh, where the stories they produce are going to be relevant to the circulation area and deliver what the audience demands. Now, I can't have a journalist sat in Cardiff Bay all day providing copies on matters with only a tenuous link to Swansea. It's a luxury I just can't afford. Uh, stories don't happen in newsrooms, just as politics, in the eyes of the Welsh public at least, isn't about what's discussed here. It's about how it affects them out there. Uh, which is why when newspapers have the option of either sending a reporter to listen to the process of government or watching its implementation and effect in the community around them, we may not be able to do both. So does that mean that local papers simply wash their hands of the Welsh government and leave the Senate press office to churn out the press releases. But I don't think we're quite there yet. Uh, and in truth, uh, there's plenty of reason to be positive. We do already carry a quota uh, from Cardiff, uh, courtesy of a combination of the work done by our own journalists, uh, the press office here, news agencies, and our contact with our, our local AMs in, in the Swansea area. The, the presiding officer, understandably, was, was keen for this profile to be, to be increased. Uh, and has already, uh, sorry, already asked me how the, the Welsh Government could seek to engage more proactively with the Welsh public. How can our politicians ensure that the press and public are more involved in the democratic process? Now, it, it certainly will seem unusual to be quoting late stand-up comedians at an event such as this, but if we take inspiration from, from Frank Carson, it's just the way you tell him. Uh, it's my view that, that people, they don't buy process, they don't necessarily buy policy, but they buy people. And if you want to broaden the appeal of the first two, then you need to get the third one right. So let's just take a few minutes to explore some, some examples. Uh, elections aside, 
One standout example of the regional press fully engaging with the political process is probably the budget. Uh, we're so interested in it, we're, we're waiting for the Chancellor to leave for work with his shiny red briefcase. <coughs> we'll print special pullouts full of the what's, the why's, the where's, and critically, of course, the who's, because that's where the local anger comes in. It's the case studies which reveal how the process and the policy is affecting the people. Because when Mrs. Jones, who's 65 and lives in her two-bedroom terraced house with husband Bernard, uh, and their Jack Russell Terrier tells us she's unable to enjoy her morning cigarette because the cost is now prohibitive. That's what people relate to. Because there are hundreds and thousands of Mrs. Joneses in our community. They're all affected the same way. And when Mrs. Jones has her say, then they all do. It's the people that matter. The process and the policy are only the supporting cast. But their relevance is clearly demonstrated by the human response at the end of the chain. If we take another example, I think Holly mentioned wind farms. Um, there's a huge debate, I guess, over whether they're actually designed to produce energy, but they're, they're certainly designed to generate some letters for local newspapers. And, and they generate stories too, because a report about the government's renewable energy policy is nowhere near as interesting as a story about a giant windmill tiring, towering above people's homes, disturbing their sleep and killing the local wildlife, as the anti-wind farm campaigners may well, com uh, may well claim. If we stick with the environment, I recently had a conversation with a Welsh AM about flooding. She'd been to a village in West Wales which had suffered a particularly severe bout of excess rainfall. Water was surrounding their homes, uh, and then she described how, how some drivers in lorries and 4x4 vehicles had been attempting to increase speed through the water in order to send, or to see how high they could send a wave up the side of people's homes. Now, what's more interesting? A politician talking about Wales needing to address the, the ever-increasing menace of climate change through a series of policies, or a human interest piece like the one I've described which will also contain the same information about a series of policies just a little further down the page. It's the human interest element of that story that promoted it to the front page of the paper that day. Uh, one final example. Uh, during my time as editor uh, of the Camarin Journal, uh, I met with several of the area's local elect elected members. Many of them had, had one particular point they wanted to raise with the editor, uh, the reintroduction of their respective columns, which had disappeared some, some months before. Uh, I eventually agreed but on the condition that they contained no political point scoring whatsoever. Because the fact that Labour can do things, in its opinion, better than the Tories or vice versa, it just isn't what people want to read. That's for the political anoraks. It isn't about people. The general public want to know what's being done by our politicians for them. It's the same question. When a politician speaks, who's really listening? And actually, there's, there's plenty of people out there willing to listen. You just have to tell it the right way. And there's many examples of our politicians getting this right. When, when the Assembly asked people to suggest laws for this country, it didn't just create a buzz around the political process, it led to the implementation of a policy that's transformed the way we shop. And it's the reason why I can't find a carrier bag in the house anymore. But the growth of our, of our digital brand uh, also heralds a new approach in the way we produce news. Uh, the tools of the trade are changing. A mobile phone today has become as important to a journalist as, as a notebook and pen. We can now write our stories remotely, take pictures and video, and upload them directly to our websites. Reporters spend more time in the field uh, and less time at their desks. It offers real potential to, to increase the amount of stories we carry online, and also the type of story, too. During my discussion with, with Rosemary, I mentioned that uh, Swansea City Manager, sorry, a video of, uh, of Swansea City Manager, Michael Laudrup, playing in a, in a kickabout against the press team, attracted the interest of 130,000 visitors over a single weekend huge number for us at the, at the Evening Post. Uh, she, she offered to put on a football kit herself and start kicking some balls around, but I've, I've declined that up to now. But it does demonstrate the need for more innovative ideas in terms of content generation uh, and an appreciation of a different audience and a new approach in order to capture them. Uh, it's up to our politicians to, to play their part and work with us, I think, to create more engaging content for, for it's their audience as well as ours, I guess. Uh, there's more room online for what I call the drier content of the process of government because transferring digital content is less reliant on people. Uh, our digital brand also doesn't have quite the same restrictions from, from a geographical or a pagination perspective as the print product. There's an opportunity to, to release the, the more traditional shackles and generate as much content as we want to. Uh, we're already looking uh, at the creation of a Welsh Government channel on our website, uh, taking what's being discussed here directly to our digital audience. Uh, though we're not necessarily op offering an open goal, we will be watching and our, our politicians can expect to be challenged. But in summary, I think, I think there is an appetite within the regional press, certainly at the Evening Post, to consider our approach to the coverage of national issues. It, it comes down to the message uh, and the method of delivery and an acceptance of the need for change if they're going to be effective. 
Uh, as I said, politics doesn't have to be about policy and process. Um, really, it's, it's about people. Thanks. You, you said there that um, you know, new technology and so on was actually freeing up your reporters from the desk, getting out, yeah. out and about more. That's against the normal story that we hear these days, that, that the journalists are more and more shackled to their desks by increasing demands and fewer resources and so on. So, so how has that come about? Because that does sound to be different from the kind of narrative we normally hear. Yeah, yeah. well, we, we have a, uh, a reporter app which has been created uh, centrally by the, uh, by the local world team, um, uh, and that will be uh, filtered out now to the, to the various sites within our group. Reporters can then download this technology. It's only it's only been made available this week, so uh, quite how it pans out, I think I'll have to pop back and let you all know. But um, basically, they're able now to write, uh, take pictures, uh, take video, upload it straight to the site, uh, and they can do that remotely. So there, there's less of a requirement for them to be sat in the office as, as often as they are currently. So you're going to be expecting them to be out reporting on what's happening in the community? Yeah, I think, I, yeah, as I say, I mean, you know, stories don't necessarily happen in the newsroom. That's we, we get the press releases in the newsroom. But if we're going to be out there representing... Uh, the communities we serve, then we need to be out there amongst them and, and talking to them directly. So it, it does release them from uh, from some of the more um, office-based duties that they have at the moment. And can I just check the, the question I, I asked with Kevin and Holly? How, how many of your local council meetings do you get reported uh, week in, week out? We cover as, as, as many as we can. Um, we, we don't get to everyone. That's that's yeah. for sure. We just don't have the. And, and, the and do you think it makes a difference if you if you do or you don't? Is it is it your uh, sense it of public duty no, or is, does the community care? Absolutely, it makes a huge difference. I, I mean, I've I've only been at the Evening Post uh, a few months now, but uh, during my time in in Carmarthen, we uh, there were a few councils we identified that we weren't covering. So uh, I sent one reporter to I think it was to to Lampeter, um, and he came back the next day and he said it was like welcoming royalty, and they were they were delighted to have a member of the press sat there taking notes and. And they, uh, just from that meeting, you know, you, you suddenly were taking calls from, from oh. councillors and people in Lampeter because they felt you were willing to reach out to them and, and, um, and represent what was going on in their community. So it's, it's critical that we're out there. And was it, but it wasn't just the councillors who were pleased they were getting reported. It was the community as well. Yeah, well don't forget, well. councillors are the community. You know, yeah. these, these people, they're local councillors. They're also the local butcher. They're, they're the chap who delivers the mail in the morning. You know, these, these people are. They're, they're very much part of their community. They also have... Um, an interest maybe in local politics, and they and they you know uh, devote their time to to representing their community, which is great. But it's our job to get out there, and and um, and promote what's what's going on. Great. Okay. Any questions for Jonathan? Take the mic, Jenny, so we can make sure we get it recorded. Hello, uh, Jenny Sims, NUJ. Uh, my question isn't just for Jonathan, but for the three speakers this afternoon. And it is really about um, employing journalists and qualified, good journalists. And as you've just demonstrated, um, sending qualified journalists to cover council meetings, courts, it generates quality stories. Uh, whereas if they're not out there, then you don't, you, surely your readership falls. What can you tell us that's positive and optimistic about perhaps continuing to employ good, qualified, quality journalists? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you'll be aware, just as I am, that, that there are, as I've said, fewer jobs for journalists today. We have seen um, many redundancies within our industry over the last five years in, in particular. Um, and it's, it's difficult to really pin down where we'll end up as an industry. As I say, we are in, in, in this period of, of transformation where we're we're embracing the, the benefits of the digital audience, uh, sorry, the digital brand. Uh, we are seeing the print product uh, decline. How far that decline goes, I, I don't know. But we're, we're investigating new revenue streams. Is, is there an opportunity for, for newspapers to, to make more money? Um, you know, w with that will come more opportunities for, for jobs. I think the, the kind of jobs now within newsrooms as well is going to change. I think there's, there's a need now for more and I hate to use some of the terminology, but there's a need for more content generators, or, or as, as we call them, reporters, um, to be out there <laughs> writing stories. Um, and you know, hopefully there, there'll, there'll be an opportunity for us to, to, to increase um, the amount of positions we have available. I'd love to be able to give you a definite answer. I don't think any of us know, to be honest. We're, 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 at, a, we're at a moment in time where there is uncertainty over, over where we'll end up as an industry, but I, I think there's reason to be positive. But there's, there's, there's many challenges facing us, unquestionably. Kevin? Yeah, well, I can give you a positive story, actually, because um, at the Argus over, uh, over the summer, starting in July, we're going to be adding uh, pagination to our paper um, so that 
At the moment, our minimum pagination on an early week is, is 28 pages, which I don't think is good enough, so that's going to move up to 40, and at the same time, I'm taking on two additional reporters, not, not uh, filling vacancies, that's two reporters on top of our current uh, uh, numbers. Um, and the other point I'd make, um, I can't talk for other newspapers, but certainly on mine, we only, we only employ um, uh, qualified, properly trained journalists, a, a lot of whom, I have to say, have been through the Cardiff course, which is one of the best in, mm. in Britain, if not the best. Um, I, I, I certainly don't employ anybody who's not been through a, pr a, a proper training course. Can I just add as well, sorry, I've, I've been back with, with Local World, I was um, uh, at another uh, newspaper group previously, but I've been back about seven months, and in that time, we've, we've not made any journalists redundant, and, and we've hired... I think we've hired about seven or eight, I'm sure, that acro across the Post Journal and Star. I think we've, we've brought in quite a few uh, people. And uh, there is there is the belief in the print product. While, while I say it's 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 in decline in terms of circulation uh, figures, we, we still believe in it. And uh, to pick up on, on Kevin's point there, we're, there's there's a number of different um, products in, in development stage now. I mean, the Evening Post should, should hopefully be launching a new weekend supplement a new entertainment guide on a Thursday, uh, potentially a travel guide on a Wednesday. So there's there's um, a view that we can do more with our print product. We're, no, um, we're not uh, necessarily putting all our eggs in the digital basket and cutting the, the newspapers free. That isn't what I'm what I'm saying. Uh, it's it's just about how the paper uh, reinvents itself, if you like, or at least repositions itself within the market to complement uh, the fact that people want their news in a different way. But there's still a belief that the the print product can can succeed and thrive. It's just how we address that. Jonathan, I think I'm right in saying that, you know, as you say, you're part of the local world, that your CEO recently said that the group is looking to uh, increase content by about 20%, but will be looking to, to UGC, unit yeah. user or reader-generated content, to, yeah. to make up a lot of that. Yeah. So that that's, that supposes, therefore, a different kind or a deeper kind of interactivity and relationship with your readership. It is. I mean, it's, it, it's a combination of things, really. Y yes, I mean, absolutely. Our, our the majority of our content should be produced by qualified professional journalists. There's, there's no two ways about that. But there, it's a fact that, that user-generated content is also popular. You look at YouTube, you look at, at, at Facebook, you know, people are really engaged with these sites. And it's, it's nothing to do with quality news journalism. It, there's, there, there is an appetite out there for a different kind of news as well. But that should complement rather than become the, you know, the, the, the major Not shareholder in terms of our content. Yeah. Yeah. Did you want to pick up on this? Um, I was just going to say something on the training aspect and qualified journalists. Um, it's very important to us that we do have quality journalists. Um, at the Western Telegraph, it can be difficult for us to recruit people who have already got the first level of NTTJ qualifications, which is what we look for. And we do find that um, we, we have to train a lot of ours in-house, but that does give us the luxury that um, a significant number of my journalists are all homegrown Pembrokeshire people, they've been through education, they care about it, their families live in Pembrokeshire, they care passionately therefore about everything that they're writing about and about the community that we're in, um, and then we take them through the training process on, on the paper. But um, it's the, f the first paper I've worked on where literally the majority of the staff are Pembrokeshire born and bred and raised, um, and as I say, that, that shows in the kind of stories that they're covering and, and how we cover the stories, because it's our community, it's where we're living. Okay, other questions? We're, we're thick and fast, so... Uh here first and then uh thanks well i think uh, jonathan has brought us back to where we should be and it is about people and we all get caught up in the process and the paperwork now is more than it's ever been and process will always take you away from people and the politicians are there to represent their community that's their only reason for being there and their local knowledge to try and make better communities and we it's easy to lose sight of that you know, and a, a simple example, and perhaps it's not fair, but when ministers come and speak at conferences, they're so damn busy, they say their bit and they go. So they don't learn anything from the people that are there with the knowledge. And it's that sort of thing that everybody's so damn busy, but are they spending their time doing the right things? And if you build up the trust so that the politicians can contact the newspapers, because to spend hours at a council meeting isn't always the best, you know, best use of time. But if you can know that you'll have two or three politicians contact you about the relevant story, which you can check with other sources, but it's about we can close the democratic deficit if we're working together. So I'm sorry that's not a question really, although it could be in terms of, you know, how do you think that could work better so that everybody's time is used uh, better and represents local uh, common people. I think it is about working together, isn't it? Um, 
you know, it, it is about building relationships, and, and that's that's true of journalists, and, and you're absolutely right, it's true of politicians as well. It's important that, that they do um, get out in the field, as it were, and, and, and meet the people who, you know, who, who put them in the position where they are and, and, and understand what's going on. And, and, you know, I, I think that's, th that is the case for, for, for many of our elected members, but um, the more they engage, I think, with the local, local newspapers, uh, the easier they'll find it to get their to get their message across, but it's important they recognise that there is a need for, for what they say to be relevant to the area that that, that newspaper serves, um, and, uh, and a greater understanding uh, just by having conversations maybe with, with editors or journalists would really help to move that along. Okay, we've got a, a question here and then another one. Gareth Norlais. I think the, the heritage of your sort of imprints is something that Wales could be proud of. As the balance shifts um, away from print over time towards, you know, sort of um, <coughs> screens, what sort of ways of keeping the things going uh, financially have you got up your sleeve online when people go online to read your stories? If anyone wants to pick that one up. Okay, we're start. Um, well, first of all, I'm talking in a purely personal capacity here. So, you know, what I'm about to say does not represent at the moment our company policy, but Obviously, we are, we, are, we are pushing the advertising model um, online, but I have a very firm personal belief that within the next five years or so, all newspapers will begin charging for content. Uh, you know, my view is that's how we should have started this model in the first place, because you know, we've now got a generation of people who believe that news is free, and it isn't, because news has got a cost, and therefore it should have a value. Um, so, I mean, I think that you're already seeing that on an awful lot of uh, news websites across the states. Obviously, we've already seen um, uh, the, the Times and the Sunday Times um, do that. Now, those people who are firmly in the digital camp and the news is free camp will say, well, look at the Times and the Sunday Times and, you know, their unique users have gone from the millions into the hundreds of thousands. My, argu my argument would be, and Holly kind of mentioned this when she talked about the type of stories that, that get the biggest hit. And if I think back to um, my last editorship, which, which is of um, the uh, Evening News in Worcester, our biggest hit while I was there uh, on a news story um, was about uh, um, Google Street View um, highlighting uh, supposedly a dead body uh, in the street. It wasn't. It was a kid playing. Uh, and that was picked up by a news aggregator in the States and gave us tens of thousands of hits. But those people aren't our audience. They'll never come back. To, to, to the Worcester News website, they were interested in that one story. And I think that's what you've got to look at. And my view is that, that when we, re when we reevaluate the, the online news model, we will find that those people who want our news, uh, and, and I think in the, in, in the local media, often what we produce you can't actually find anywhere else, those people who want it will be prepared to pay a reasonable amount for it, providing that it's easy to pay for, in the same way it's easy to download music from iTunes. Um, uh, uh, etc. And those people will actually be our loyal audience, uh, and that loyal audience becomes a more attractive to advertisers. Uh, Holly, presumably you can't expect your Russian readers to pay no, for pictures I don't of the beast of I don't of think Tempe. they're going to pay for pictures of the beast of Tembe. No, um, I mean it, it, it is it is obviously something that's looked at all the time. Um, you know, I I love newspapers. <laughs> It's one of the, one of the reasons. Ever since a you know very young age of two or three, I remember getting told off for screwing up my dad's Telegraph because I obviously couldn't cope with the broadsheet paper. But um, it, it's my own views. You know, there's, there, there are all these websites and web apps, but you're only looking at one story at a time. You're clicking through. I personally prefer the page turning kind of um, software, and, and that's how I I view a lot of my newspapers now digitally. Um, and I think more and more we're just going to have to look at everybody wants to consume their information in a slightly different way and we, we're going to have to do that through apps through websites through page turning whatever that might be as well as as the print project while there's demand for it yeah in terms of advertising revenue i i, I can see that there may well be a natural shift uh, among our advertisers because i think advertisers are, are becoming more more uh, savvy i guess to the the benefits of of advertising online as well uh, they still probably get the better response out of a print product, which is why you know predominantly that's where people prefer to be. But there is a greater awareness now of, of, of a change, uh, a change in attitudes, um, and, and a growing audience online as well. And I think the bigger the audience becomes, and the more attractive it becomes to to, to advertisers. So you may well see some of this uh, revenue, you know, shifting almost naturally. Okay, we've got a question here, Steve Crow. Uh, 
Uh, I've been talking to a couple of, uh, or quite a few journalists here this, uh, the last couple of weeks who would have worked at one time in newsrooms like yours and are now working for politicians, special interest groups, charities, who say that quite often they are submitting press releases to newspapers in Wales that go in more or less as they're written, unsubbed, no new intro, no follow-up questions and all the rest of it. Is that necessarily a bad thing? And do you accept that it's happening? Who wants to, wants to go that? first? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, well I'll, I'll answer it. I, I mean, I, I suppose my answer to that would be if we receive a press release that is extraordinarily badly written, it'll get rewritten. If we receive a press release that is balanced and objective and makes sense, then why waste our resource on doing the same job twice? How do you know how the press sense? Because that's my job. Yes, of course they are. But, I mean, the reality is that the, the, the vast majority of those type of press releases will make nibs, news and briefs in our papers, maybe a couple of paragraphs. And, and you know, again, my, my view is that I would, I would rather use my resource um, creating uh, compelling content than, than use it on, on rewriting stuff that, as you quite rightly say, is quite often now written by people who used to work in our newsrooms and therefore are, are, are trained and, uh, and perfectly adequate journalists. I think it may go in um, untouched, but it's certainly been read. Uh, yeah. So if, if the news desk has read it and, and considered it um, a, a decent piece of journalism, and again, as, as Kevin says, I mean, it, they tend to be on, on matters that don't necessarily need um, interrogation or investigation. Uh, they're nibs or, or short stories. And, uh, but it'll certainly be read, even if it's not changed. And if, if it's written by a, a former journalist, I'd expect it to be of a decent, uh, decent standard anyway. So it may well be that it's, it's, it's fit to go in. Some of it, some of it. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, question in the front. You can just just wait for the microphone. Uh, I just wanted to know, uh, where do you see the local newspaper after five or ten years? F five or ten, probably. Um, I, I think we'll we'll still have new. I'm, I'm certain we'll still have newspapers five or ten years time. Uh, I think if you if you if you're talking about the future of, of newspapers generally, if we're talking. 40, 50 years down the line, uh, we may still have newspapers, but it may be that people, uh, while wanting quality local news journalism, might, might possibly even wanting to be able to physically turn the pages, may want to do that digitally. So will we see uh, the launch of a tablet form, of, of, as some papers have done, where you can, you can you know, literally turn the page, but you're holding it on a, on a modern uh, technological device as opposed to that old, outdated print product that uh, they once produced? It, I, I don't think newspapers will disappear. I think it just we just may change how we deliver it. Anyone else anyway? Well, I, I mean, you know, how we do things uh, is vastly different today than it was 10 years ago, although the print product still remains um, uh, the, the primary um, thing that we produce. And I, I don't see in a five or 10 year period um, uh, an end to, to print products. And I, and I think you also we need to remember that for a lot of uh, traditional local daily newspapers are the, the print audience um, tends to be an older audience um, so the gap the gap certainly between print and online uh, will continue to narrow but I mean uh, it's worth remembering I don't think anybody's quoted this stat uh, today but um, in terms of local news uh, for the UK as a whole uh, there are four times as many people still who receive their local news at least once a week from uh, print media than do from online media um, we've, we've got in South Wales two examples of um, community websites which have started out on the web and are now looking to move into print, and it's the Caffili Observer in, in your area, Kevin, and the Talbot Magnet in, yeah. in your area. <coughs> so they, those community sites clearly see going into print as something which can generate then more advertising income, but can also mean they get taken more seriously by institutions that they're trying to report. I don't know whether this seems a sort of strange circle that's that's going on there. Well, possibly, but I think it just demonstrates, uh, as I said, we you know we are in the, in this in this tunnel of uncertainty, if you like, where we're not quite sure where we'll end up. But it's clear that, that, that newspapers are still very relevant. You know, they're not they're not going away anytime soon, and and th they still have uh, you know a huge profile and and respect in the communities that, that they serve. So it, it, it's it's natural, I guess, for for news websites to want to launch uh, print products as as we stand today. I mean. 
picking up on your point, where would we be in 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years' time? Things may well change, but in, in the here and now, uh, you know, newspapers um, are, are still you know, fantastic products that are loved by a huge amount of people. Okay, any, any final questions? We've got one at the back. Um, when I was a journalist uh, in 99, I now I'm Johan Bell and I now work for Simon Thomas, Assembly Member for Mid and West Wales. When I was a journalist in 99, um, it's been touched upon by David Melding, the fact there were um, people from the Argus and also the South Wales Evening Post who were um, employed in, in the Bay uh, reporting on politics, Welsh politics. I was just wondering, um, you said, obviously, I appreciate that... Um, there's, uh, um, there's f a finite uh, resources, but have you thought about syndication? You know, in in Washington um, and in the U U.S., they have um, uh, you know people who are writing columns um, that for local press across the states from uh, Washington. And I was just wondering whether the panel thought that that might be a good idea uh, in order to try and uh, tackle the democratic deficit. Interesting question. Could you have syndicated political columns? Um, <coughs> we could. Um, I, I mean, my view is that the, the, the syndication model in terms of uh, politics and in particular um, uh, with the Assembly uh, has actually probably been and gone because um, what, what happened when uh, most of us withdrew full-time members of staff uh, um, uh, from the Assembly is that was that the Press Association attempt, attempted to fill that gap um, and then the Press Association also found that it wasn't the most productive use of its staff uh, and so reduced its resources accordingly. Um, so I personally don't see that as, uh, as a way forward because I, I think it's something that's, that's already been tried and, 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 and didn't work particularly well. Is, is it different if it's um, a, an opinion piece, a columnist is doing opinion as opposed to straight reporting? Well, potentially, um, and, and we run a number of, 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 of opinion columns, but... I mean, I don't know, Jonathan may have a different view uh, to me, but I mean, I would much rather be running kind of exclusive opinion columns rather than mm. one that you can pick up in, in several other newspapers. Jonathan, presumably syndication doesn't meet your criteria mm. of local relevance. Absolutely, so. it's, it's it precisely that, it's relevance. Um, you know, syndicated copy couldn't hope to achieve that, and it, you know, we, we deal with our own local areas, and it's important that the, the people we have are relevant and what they're talking about is relevant. You can't achieve that if it's, uh, if it's generic across the copy. Okay, uh, yeah, on that question. Um, but, I mean, again, a long time ago, well, not that long ago, I worked in newspapers as well, and the syndication model worked then at a Westminster level where one reporter would uh, work across two, three titles um, and provide specific uh, locality-based um, reports uh, to the newspaper, and then the loss of copy was um, covered. So the question there, I suppose, is why doesn't that apply to assembly politics, Welsh national perspective, and can that, do we really seriously need to consider now crossing that Rubicon of perhaps publicly funding that sort of syndication in order to maintain the local news model in Wales? I, I don't know if we, if we do need to take that step. I, I think we, you know, we, already, we already get um, a significant amount of copy that, that we, we, we can localise ourselves in-house. Um, it's an interesting one. Um, I, I personally, I, I, I just don't think it would work from my perspective. Okay, any final questions before we, we wrap up? Well, um, I, I think it's been a really interesting discussion. Some of the things we've had, I haven't captured everything, but the, the messages we've heard through the day are, firstly, it's not all bad. Devolution has been a success and continues to, uh, to evolve and develop and succeed. Welsh media is much better than um, uh, media in many other parts of the UK. People may be disengaged from institutions, doesn't mean they're disengaged from politics, and so perhaps we shouldn't blame the messenger too much. Uh, on the other hand, there have been some quite um, uh, uh, pointed suggestions that um, perhaps political issues need to be made more directly relevant to the public rather than the institutions, less of a punch and judy show, um, that we should, uh, that policy and process don't sell, but people do. do. We need to simplify the language, explain the institutions better, uh, and perhaps use social media to reach out and interact more. Um, some practical things about using Wales as a comparison with the rest of the UK, using data to illustrate what's happening in Wales as against the rest of the UK. Practical things like perhaps extending video feeds to local newspapers for websites, 
enabling them to uh, enhance kind of Welsh government channels and so on. Uh, thinking about civic education, as, as, as Holly uh, pointed out as well, and bringing uh, particular uh, um, responsibilities of the Senate to the fore with clear positions and opinions. And finally, there was the thought that, you know, perhaps Wales needs authority figures both in the media uh, and in politics to lead the debate and drive uh, uh, the kind of social engagement a bit more. And to do that, we need more frankness, more openness, and maybe a little less PR control. Well, that's all I'm sure we have lots of opinions about all of them, and there were many other things discussed as well. But um, I'd like uh, to thank all of our panellists this afternoon as well as those this morning and invite David to come up and, uh, and close the session. But please thank, thank, thank you for your comments. Thank you, Richard, and uh, I think it's been a highly enjoyable day, informative, challenging, and at times a little awkward to, as, as a politician sat listening to some of the messages, but that's really what uh, we wanted, and, I, and I'm particularly grateful to all the panellists and indeed uh, to you, the audience, for being so engaged and asking some, uh, I think, really apposite uh, questions and, and making highly relevant uh, comments. If I can just reflect on the morning session... First, uh, well, there's some key messages. Uh, uh, we were told quite boldly that London print media is not going to change their, their own difficulties uh, and that we need to look uh, elsewhere, particularly the new media. I think Peter Riddell, the uh, former Times correspondent, and some highly committed to uh, political coverage uh, and, and his involvement uh, in, in, in the think tank, uh, clearly really, really uh, engaged in this uh, issue. But I thought it was quite a hard-edged comment there uh, and that you know perhaps uh, we're, we're never going to get Welsh editions of uh, the Telegraph or the Times and uh, even if we did that may not be the key audience we would want to engage with. Um, I'm sorry I missed Peter's uh, uh, contribution. I, I had a, a, an engagement I couldn't myself uh, 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 change as I'd already cancelled it once but I, I, w I, I know it will be on Senate TV uh, incidentally all our uh, uh, proceedings will be and I do hope that uh, some of you will, uh, will access that but uh, I, I understand he had some pr pretty pungent things to say about uh, our, our debating style saying you know, kindly that uh, many of the debates are excellent but uh, th there were issues in some of them uh, as a presiding officer I, I couldn't possibly comment on that and he did think that uh, AMs weren't always engaged and they were uh, concentrating too much on their computers. Well, uh, I think in 99, the fact that we had uh, computers in the chamber w w was groundbreaking. Oh, we had people from all over the world coming to look at that. Uh, I, and, and now, I suppose, 14 years later, it's, uh, <coughs> it's probably commonplace to bring portable devices in, but perhaps not to have your workstation there. So I'll, I'll take that back to my fellow AMs. I'm not sure they'll agree, but I thought it was an interesting uh, uh, comment, as was the suggestion that the presiding officer should make ministers ask, uh, answer questions. I think a lot of AMs would uh, sign up to that. Uh, it would make uh, uh, our job as presiding officers uh, a, a lot tougher. We wouldn't be very popular with ministers sometimes, though they do often answer the questions uh, uh, very effectively and uh, concisely, but you know, perhaps not always. But then again, they're not always asked terribly straight and fair questions, but uh, I should leave that uh, with you to ponder. Um, and again, uh, I thought it was an important point in terms of the morning session, really, so I think was, was th th that critical, helpful advice, but was based on get real, reflect on yourself, see what works, and challenge, and come up with in, you know, innovative ways to do things better. And um, Peter Riddell said, uh, you know, we need to explain the legislative process and simplify the language. I think that's true throughout uh, 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 democratic institutions, and it was true at the Westminster level and, and in Scotland as well. But, you know, if we do want to get more people to contribute to our, our, our legislative process, then it's got to be more accessible. And we've got to look at ways of uh, improving participation and engagement because uh, most people wouldn't be terribly calm if they were brought before an assembly committee. No matter how friendly that committee tries to be, it is not what most people are used to. And there are other ways of getting, uh, uh, working to get engagement. And indeed, that's a current work, sc work stream that the presiding officer has, uh, has commenced in terms of increasing our participation and increasing the resources we devote in the Assembly Commission 
to participation. Can I just say, I found the afternoon uh, session uh, particularly valuable and interesting because I think we were really down uh, to discussing the issues that could lead to better coverage and better cooperation because at the end of the day, these are the outlets that mean most to us because they will be covering us on a day-to-day -day basis and, uh, uh, and we want to ensure that uh, your job is made uh, more interesting and, and easier in terms of getting that important political information that you need and also that uh, we improve the level of coverage so that we serve the electorate uh, uh, better. And, uh, <coughs> and we heard from Kevin that uh, the death of regional media is greatly exaggerated. I think the death of politics is greatly exaggerated. Uh, as, uh, as we were told, there aren't many people who are not interested in what's happening to their A&E <coughs> services in the local hospital or uh, if uh, um, uh, the, the, the local education system is being changed. These things are obviously meat and drink to people. They really affect uh, uh, everyday life. And in fact, overall, the audiences are bigger for regional and local news, though the outlets uh, or the manner, the mode is changing. So that's really a key one. Um, I think it was Kevin did ask uh, where were the AMs. Well, this is a working day, so AMs are in, in committee, but I, I will be taking some of these uh, messages back. I would say to our visitors that there are a lot of uh, 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 AM support staff here, and I'm sure they were, and in group staff as well, and I'm sure they were sent so that these messages could be relayed. I know all political groups take this subject very seriously, and it is something, I think, for the political groups to look at, because there are resources available to uh, <coughs> in, uh, uh, facilitate engagement with the media, and the way we do that uh, and has to uh, change, I think, as well. Uh, we are a bit Cardiff-centric here, which is uh, uh, something we, we, we must always reflect on, and Cardiff, geographically, is not well-placed, really, to be the capital city. We are you know, nearly the most southernmost pop point of the place I used to live, Barry, is actually the most southern part of Wales. Um, and it is important, I think, that we work very hard to be relevant to West, Mid, and North Wales, and that's, uh, that's an important issue. Uh, or even Newport, as uh, uh, that great uh, Newport County fan who is uh, here on my right, and, and it was rather wonderful, I have to say, uh, to see another Welsh club in. I mean, uh, alas, it was uh, because Wrexham lost, but uh, next year, I'm sure Wrexham will be the fourth team uh, to get into the Football League, uh, and Newport County will advance to division, let's hope. Um, so I, I thought Holly made a very important point on uh, uh, the online media in that uh, you know, it is important and growing, but uh, you do kind of need to know how to navigate it. And uh, we're looking at our web products constantly to ensure that they can be navigated fairly easily because uh, 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 typically uh, browsing through uh, a website is is not something perhaps that you know one does uh, as, as you would through a newspaper sometimes and then just coming across some uh, uh, story. So I think that was a really uh, important point about how we improve uh, the, the, the various uh, uh, products we have and, and make them more uh, uh, relevant and useful for, uh, to people. Um, and we were reminded that political content does have a place in local and regional papers. Only uh, there were three factors that I think Jonathan looked at, audience, relevance, and resource. And he also said, I think very punctually, uh, uh, as far as the public is concerned, it's not process, sometimes it's not even policy, but it's people. And that's, uh, I think, you know, a marvelous thing to take away, though putting it into practice, of course, is the constant challenge. But, you know, perhaps a concrete example there was look at case studies. And the work assembly does, and assembly committees, uh, providing case studies is perhaps a, a key way to make things relevant, and I thought that was uh, uh, really helpful and, uh, uh, and uh, something to be uh, uh, taken away. And finally, uh, another Jonathan-ism, because there were quite a few, uh, the South Wales Evening Post is now a website with a newspaper attached. That's quite, uh, quite a thought. But I think what, what it does teach us is that things change, life changes, democratic politics changes, participatory politics is changing. And if we want to stay where we are and stay the same, we will not serve the public. We don't know all the answers, but I do think we found some this afternoon. So thank you all very much for attending. There will be various products. There's a report, we're on Senate TV. There's another conference in this series on the 12th of June when we'll be looking at the blog sphere and, and the like uh, specifically. But can I just finish by thanking Richard and uh, this afternoon's panelists and this morning's, and I know you want to show your appreciation in the normal way. Thank you.